Okay, and here we go. Hello, everyone, and welcome to our webinar this afternoon. Um, we are with ASTCT, and our webinar is the Innovations and Lessons, Pharmacy Practice and Drug Therapy Considerations Amid the COVID-19 Pandemic. We want to thank you all for taking the time out of your afternoon to attend this webinar and thank the speakers as well for generously donating their time and expertise. Before we get started, we just have a couple quick housekeeping options for today's webinar. The slides and recording will be distributed and posted to the ASTCT COVID-19 community page. There will be a section of questions and answers at the end of the presentations today. So if you have any questions throughout the presentation, please submit them using the Zoom panel on the bottom of your screen as seen here. If we're unable to answer your question during the webinar, you can always email us at info at ASTCT.org or post them to the COVID-19 community page directly. We will be sharing the link to that page at the end of this presentation. At this time, I would like to hand the webinar over to Zara, who's one of our speakers, who will start with introductions and get us going for the day. Zara? Hello, everyone. We are really looking forward to reviewing our pharmacy practice drug therapy considerations amid the COVID-19 pandemic. Certainly, this isn't something we intended on doing this year, but I'm excited to have this opportunity to present with, along with my co-presenters. Um, my name is Zara uh, Mamu Jafari. I'm a clinical pharmacy manager at the University of Kansas Health System and the immediate past chair of the ASTCT Pharmacy Special Interest Group Steering Committee. I'll serve as your moderator during today's session. I'm joined today by my colleagues, Maurice Alexander, the current chair and pharmacy manager at the University of North Carolina Medical Center, and Katie Kulos, a clinical pharmacist at the Vanderbilt University Medical Center, and a working member of our steering committee. When our steering committee convened after TCT in February, COVID-19 was just becoming a real issue in the United States and was really declared a global pandemic by March 11th. Things around that time really began to rapidly evolve and we each have had we each have been part of a several practice changes at our institutions with little to no guidance given that something like this has never occurred before in our vulnerable patient population, as well as the clinical literature was also rapidly developing as it continues to rapidly develop. So at the time, we decided to convene and develop general recommendations, incorporating available technologies and reporting on the available medical literature, and that ultimately led us to our pharmacy position statement that was recently published in BBMT and is also available on the ASTC website. So in our next slide, we're going to go through our objectives for today's webinar, and we really want it to be as interactive as possible after we've reviewed um, and explored inpatient and outpatient practice model considerations for supporting social distancing during COVID-19 highlight the growth and expansion of telehealth during COVID-19 and what it means for our future, discussing our technology that's available for supporting remote practice models and telehealth, and then lastly, reviewing current therapeutic agents under investigation for COVID-19 treatment, highlighting special considerations for the HCT population. Please feel free to um, enter questions as they come along and we will hopefully be able to answer them. So to kick us off, Maurice, um, we'll be talking about pharmacy practice considerations. All right, thank you, Zara. Um, as, she, as she mentioned, COVID-19 has required that we really modify the way that we deliver care to our patients. And so what I'll be reviewing are some practice model considerations for both inpatient and outpatient environments. And much of what I'll share is really informed by some of the strategies that we've used at my institution, but also some of the approaches that, um, that I think people have used as I've had conversations with folks across the country. Um, I also understand that practice models may vary and depend on uh, how well resourced your, your, your practice environments are. And so I'll try to kind of highlight what are strategies that you can take depending on how many resources you have in your inpatient units or your outpatient clinic. And so I'll start with, um, on the next slide, we'll start with inpatient considerations. Um, and so obviously the, the overarching goal here has been to limit exposure to both, not only patients, but also healthcare providers as well. And so any practice strategies that you implement should help support that goal. And so one of the things that we've done at UNC and one of the things that has also seemed to be a very common and very popular approach is a rotating model. 
whereby you had both on-site and off-site support. Now, again, this is a model that requires you to have um, a few FTEs or resources um, to rotate through each of those positions. Um, and so, as the rotation shows, you could have someone on site for a week or however long you decide, um, and then they would rotate onto an off site role while someone off site would rotate onto on site coverage. Um, and so, for those that maybe don't have the resources for a rotating model, or for those people that are rotating um, and are, uh, are trying to implement social distancing strategies for that person that is covering on site, some of the things that you can consider to help limit exposure to patients and team members are listed on the slide. And so that includes virtual rounds whereby you would connect with the team electronically uh, or virtually via whatever platform you use. Um, if you are rounding in person, then making sure that you're maintaining social distancing practices by uh, guarding with PPE such as masks or even remaining at least six feet apart. Um, and then also one strategy for the on-site folks is to make sure you're limiting access to patient rooms. And so while, you, while the team collectively may have a conversation about the patient, identifying maybe a team member or two, that will be the designated folk to enter the room um, and evaluate the patient. And so on the next slide, um, we, we have listed here the things that uh, can be considered in terms of how you may think about distributing services between your on-site resources and your off-site resources. So for those that are on-site, um, as previously mentioned, they can engage in rounding activities, whether it be virtually or in person. Um, on-site folks are really there also to uh, help respond to any acute emergent needs, such as rapid responses and codes. They can also provide that on-demand clinical support, which um, often involves things like patient home medica uh, medication verification or patient home medication storage, uh, and can um, help with chemotherapy review and verification. And they can also uh, help with patient education. Those folks that are in off-site roles um, during this time, again, they can engage in rounds um, uh, as long as it is virtual as well. Um, something that we've done is enable remote order verification. And so that was something that we got approval for from our state board of pharmacy. And so our offsite pharmacists are still verifying orders for their respective services. Um, uh, and they still have access to the med medical records so they can complete patient profile review, ther uh, therapeutic drug monitoring, and, and continue to help the on-site resource with chemotherapy order preparation and review as well. Also, they can be yeah, they also help the patient education by calling into patient rooms um, to help support that effort as well. So on the next slide, we'll uh, highlight some of the other considerations that have gone into um, ways that we manage drug supply and actually prepare for um, some of the peaks and the surges that we have anticipated in different regions of the country. Um, and so uh, all have have probably been aware of some of the shortages that have come up due to COVID-19, one of the most common being the food smell supply and human use, uh, car fee and cell therapy spaces. And so anticipating and planning for those shortages are critically important. And so many centers, many centers have taken strategies such as sequestering drugs or making sure that they um, separate out supply of the Tuscaloosa map to make sure they have enough on hand for CAR-T efforts versus having enough on hand for COVID-19. Um, uh, uh, implementing strategies to expedite T and T restrictions have also been useful. Um, many centers, one example here is that many centers have a protocol whereby staff have to garb up with PPE to administer health contaminating. Um, and so obviously, would all have had to implement strategies to help preserve um, or conserve our PPE. And so uh, one thing that our uh, PN, IV PNT committee did was to implement a restriction uh, in health and uh, in encouraging folks to use restrictive um, options.
um, uh, helping to limit the number of folks uh, that are uh, accessing the patient room and also limiting the number of times that folks have to go into the patient room. In terms of surge preparation, um, there, there have been efforts to minimize length of stay where possible. And so these are things like really facilitating discharges. And so one of the things that our center has done is expand the hours that our meds to bed service is available so that we can really facilitate getting patients out of the hospital. Um, and then lastly, making sure that the hospital is making plans for uh, capacity and service overflow. Um, and so one of the examples that applies to something that we've done is um, specifically to our transplant unit, that unit is a closed unit. Because of the immunocompromised nature of our patients, we have been really selective about the types of patients that will um, be uh, assigned to our unit as overflow. And so most of our uh, hematology oncology patients, we have specified that those are the patients that should come to our unit um, if, uh, if there's a need for those services to use a different unit for overflow. On the next slide, um, we will, you'll see some outpatient considerations. And again, the goal here is in alignment with what we discussed in the inpatient setting. And so that is, again, uh, limiting the exposure to both patients and team members. Um, the, the same approach has been a popular approach in the outpatient setting, whereby folks have a rotating model um, providing both on-site and off-site support. And so some of the things to consider for those that are on site in the outpatient arena are really optimizing scheduling for, um, for days that patients are having to come to clinic. And that allows you to potentially minimize the number of days that you do actually have to be on site to provide direct patient care support. Also, there is the opportunity to provide virtual care function. And so calling into patient, um, calling patients who may be in rooms in the clinic to go through patient education or talk through medication related problems is still also um, a viable and reasonable approach. Um, social distancing practices in clinics are still very important. So all of us probably work in very tight spaces with our providers and with our nursing teams. And so making sure that we are maintaining six feet of adequate space between us to minimize exposure among staff as well. And then similar to what we discussed in the inpatient arena, uh, really minimizing the number of folks and the frequency um, that folks have to access patient rooms. On the next slide, you'll see kind of a, a distribution of services for the outpatient setting. And so some, a lot of this is um, overlap from what we discussed on the inpatient side. But uh, on-site support can really help provide, again, that acute emergent need for rapid responses and codes. Um, they can also uh, provide that on-demand clinical support. And those things really help to maintain clinic efficiency and throughput. On the, on the off-site um, side, uh, services can really be provided via a virtual mechanism. And I think this is one of the biggest lessons that we've learned during COVID-19 is that telehealth or telemedicine is a strategy that we really should be leveraging. And so on the outpatient side, for those that have order verification responsibilities, this can be a service that is maintained. We can maintain therapeutic drug monitoring and chemotherapy review. We can maintain patient education activities and even more. And I think the list goes on and on for what we can do virtually because on the next slide, as you can see, I've highlighted here kind of um, the, the importance of virtual care. And so I do think that telehealth, telemedicine, or virtual care um, has become something that will not only just get us through COVID-19, but a strategy for care that is here to stay. And so there have been several perspectives that have been published um, about telemedicine in the context of COVID-19, and this is one of them, and it really speaks to how care is migrating to the patient's home rather than having the patient come to clinic. Um, and so uh, prior to COVID, um, you can see there was just a small fraction of physician practices that use telemedicine as reported by this perspective in Lancet. Um, 
However, over the past decade, there has been an uptick in the um, payers that have agreed to pay for telemedicine services. Um, and so I think this highlights uh, two things. I think it highlights, one, the progress that we've made, but I also think it highlights how far we still have to go. Because when we, when we kind of compare our model to models that other countries are taking, they've already kind of made plans to make it a mainstream or a center of care. And I think that's the, the direction we need to go in to be able to better service our patients, not just during COVID-19, but even, even after. Um, and, and as we move to the next slide, I think the, the thing that I wanted to highlight here is that there are several things you should consider when identifying who may be appropriate for telehealth and how you'll deliver that service. And so you do need to make sure that your patient is a suitable candidate for delivering uh, telehealth. And that may mean assessing whether they clinically can uh, be appropriately evaluated via a virtual mechanism, um, making sure it's a patient that has maintained adequate engagement in their care, and that they have access to the technology platform that you are using to deliver virtual care. Um, also, it does take a little bit of planning ahead uh, in terms of scheduling these types of visits. And also, it takes a little bit more coordination of care if you are using remote laboratories or remote physician offices to get the information and data that you will need to conduct your visit. And then um, Zara, in the next session of this talk, will talk about some of the technology that we um, uh, are using to deliver virtual health. So on the next slide, uh, you'll see here um, kind of how the COVID-19 pandemic has also impacted our training efforts. And so this is the timeline of events that occurred with what UNC did with our learners, both students and residents, as COVID-19 unfolded. And I won't go through the timeline in detail, but I do think what this slide highlights is that our rotations were either canceled, and if they weren't canceled, they were also moved remotely. And so virtual medicine is not only something that we've used to, to reach our patients, but it's also something that we've used to, to continue to deliver education to our learners. Um, and so that is also a piece I think that will stick and stay beyond COVID-19 as well. And the, the next slide, I think, will transition over to technology services. Thank you, Maurice. So um, on the next slide, as Maurice highlighted, uh, transplant pharmacists remain a critical and required component of the healthcare team, and we have to really ensure that we can continue to monitor our patients, provide clinical recommendations, and pro provide critical education to patients in need. So when we set out to redesign our processes, we have to keep that at the forefront of our minds. So on the next slide, we talk about initial preparation. Um, and so Reese kind of highlighted this in a few slides ago, but the modern technologies provided within our institutions can support remote clinical pharmacy services for both the inpatient and outpatient settings. It's really critical to the successful delivery of care when there is an effort to limit our patient contact. So to prepare for transition of our work to be more telehealth capable, it was critical to partner with the IT department to ensure that we maintain patient confidentiality with a secure connection. This can be done by gaining access to virtual private networks or VPNs and Citrix-like platforms. When we evaluated all of our shift responsibilities, we then determined what needed to be done in person versus remotely. For those shifts that we deemed could be done remotely, we ensured that the team members had reliable internet connection and either a home computer or an employer-issued device to log into the institu institutional electronic medical record so that they could continue to provide our clinical services. We developed guidance documents for those staff working remotely on how to, for example, check voicemail when they're not in the office or how to access translator services if needed. And as well as available technologies to be able for them to use their personal cell phones to securely call patients. As with any new process, we have to make sure to open uh, maintain open channels of communication with those working from home to the leader leadership team to ensure that the staff has the resources they need to complete their work and triage any barriers. So for example, at KU, we initially had virtual huddles three times a week to, to ensure to address any issues or concerns that the team had. And so since then, we've backed off these huddles to twice a week. And now it's more to determine how to balance the load of work. 
And on the next slide, really communication is key. Our biggest task when utilizing technology to provide these pharmacy services remotely is maintaining an equal amount of communication, both between the pharmacist and the clinical team, but also to the patients and their caregivers. And I kind of go through that here on the next slide for communication with the clinical team. Pharmacists can use secure chat and messaging functions that may be embedded in or exist outside of the medical record to communicate directly with our colleagues. That could be Epic InBasket, Epic Chat, Jabber Chat, Curator, Volt, Skype for Business, all for example, whatever is most convenient for the team. I know, for example, at our institution, we have access to Curator, Volt, and Skype for Business, and it just depends on who you're trying to communicate with. Certainly, it can be a process that can be more streamlined. Typical types of communication include clinical recommendations, doses changes, chemotherapy modifications, you name it. And then with institutions limiting or in many cases prohibiting visit visitors, education for patients and caregivers has become more difficult. And really we're looking for other measures um, that we can use to be able to contact our patients, whether that be through email, phone, or in-person virtual visits. Communication to patients can be achieved through electronic messaging or calling. If there are requests for patient resources, such as medication calendars and or customized education sheets, these can often be sent to the patient via electronic portals, including email or messaging through the electronic health record, for example, Epic MyChart, or utilizing tools such as MedAction Plan. For those of you unfamiliar with MedAction Plan, this is not a plug for them, but it is a website-based platform that allows the pharmacist to create a detailed medication calendar for the patient that can then be sent to the patient either through the EMR or through their MedAction Plan app. And it illustrates to the patients what the medication is for, when to take, and how to take. It can also help remind patients when to take their medications, allows for the healthcare team to track adherences, and track any changes. More involved education discussions and or updates to take to care plans can be completed via phone visits by using telephonic audio services, so for example, Doximity or Jabber phone, which allows the pharmacist to use their own personal phone number and keeps their number private, and allows the user to designate an institutional callback number. If the technology is available, virtual visits with webcams can be implemented, allowing for audiovisual capabilities with platforms such as Zoom that can be integrated within the EMR. Zoom visits, for example, can be scheduled ahead of time and can incorporate a virtual waiting room for patients. But most importantly, it allows for multiple healthcare providers to sit in on a visit at one time. So for example, we have partnered with our nurse practitioner colleagues to do survivorship end of treatment visits with our patients. We've also used these Zoom visits to schedule inpatient discharge education with family members and caregivers as we've changed our policy to not allow for any visitors at any time during inpatient admission. Certainly one of the challenges here is that, um, one of the challenges for telehealth specifically is that billing is dependent on individual states' legislation. Um, so you know, for example, in Kansas, we don't have that capability, but overall, despite these challenges, we've really been able to successfully leverage technology to provide clinical pharmacy services to both the clinical teams as well as patients and their caregivers. And with that, um, I'm definitely no um, queen of technology, but I am going to transition over to Katie to talk about our um, treatment options. So welcome, Katie. Thank you, Zara. Despite the variety of therapeutic options investigated thus far, there is currently no drugs or other therapeutics presently approved by the U.S. Food and Drug Administration to prevent or treat COVID-19. Researchers, however, are leaving no stone unturned and a massive increase in ongoing clinical trials. So right about the time that we submitted or created our manuscript, there were around 300 trials uh, listed on clinicaltrials.gov. However, in my last peak a few days ago, there are now more than 1,000 different clinical trials uh, listed. Uh, in our paper, we included five of the agents, which were the leading interventions at that time. However, with maturing data, uh, today, I'm really going to focus on the three most promising therapies or with the most robust data, uh, hydroxychloroquine or chloroquine, uh, remdesivir, which had some exciting data published last week, and then lastly, talk about convalescent plasma use. In the next slide, um, I'm going to start with talking about hydroxychloroquine or chloroquine. These were some of the first agents that were buzzed about um, with data and uh, information coming out of China weeks and months ago. However, over the past few months, we've definitely seen some controversial data published. These are anti-malarial agents commonly used for the treatment in the U.S. We typically will see them used for treatment of different autoimmune diseases like rheumatoid arthritis. 
However, regarding COVID-19, in vitro data demonstrates possible viral inhibition by increasing the pH of intracellular lysosomes and endosomes, leading to decreased viral membrane fusion. And some other mechanisms of potential viral inhib inhibition involve alterations of glycosylation of ACE2, as well as blocking transport and subsequent release of viral genome. And there's also an additional thought with hydroxychloroquine that we, it has the ability to reduce cytokine production. Um, recently, there was an expert panel, including pharmacists, that was assembled by the uh, NIH to create an interim COVID-19 treatment guideline uh, recommendations. So specifically regarding the use of hydroxychloroquine and chloroquine, uh, the author stated that they could not recommend against or for its use uh, for COVID-19. However, they did specifically recommend against the use of hydroxychloroquine in combination uh, with azithromycin, which was a treatment strategy that came out of some early reports from France. Next slide, please. The serious concern um, of using the combination of azithromycin and hydroxychloroquine comes from, first of all, a lack of efficacy or solid efficacy data and the elevated risk for cardiac complications due to QTC prolongation. This is already a known toxicity of both hydroxychloroquine and chloroquine plus azithro. Uh, so um, it was no surprise to see this. Um, if you are considering starting uh, hydroxychloroquine or chloroquine on at your patients, assessing their EKG is paramount. Um, in our transplant patient population, you say the word QTC at every pharmacist had turns with good reason, because um, we know that there are multiple therapeutic interventions that also prolong the QTC that our patients are typically on, such as azole antifungals, 5 h 3 antagonists, and fluoroquinolones, just to name a few. Use of uh, hydroxychloroquine or chloroquine is not recommended if a QTC is over 500, and caution is recommended if over 450 for men or 470 for women. Um, we can try to optimize electrolyte repletion uh, to reduce risk for any cardiac um, arrhythmias. Um, another less frequent side effect that we can see is hypoglycemia. So this is something that, you know, often we see alterations in our patient population's uh, sugar controls. And so we'll start them on sliding scale or potentially they came in on an oral regimen. So when initiating these treatment options, um, it's important to take a closer look at their sugars as well. Um, LFT abnormalities have been reported and with long-term use, uh, we do see ophthalmic changes and retinal toxicity. p 6 pd deficiency anemia can occur. It's more commonly associated when a patient is concomitantly on um, dapsone therapy. Next slide, please. So even though hydroxychloroquine and chloroquine are both metabolized to the same active compound, uh, hydroxychloroquine is commonly preferred uh, over the use of chloroquine due to increased toxicity. This is really gonna be uh, going back to that retinal toxicity as well as some specific drug interactions that are more prevalent with chloroquine. It's also gonna be really based on your su supply of what you're using. We have a lot more use of hydroxychloroquine in the US, so that is gonna be primarily our stock. However, if you look through different countries, um, now that COVID has been out and this is a treatment option, you'll see that they have different stocks and some are using others based really just on the logistical issue of what they have. Um, these agents do have very large half-lives which does uh, require a loading dose. So the FDA uh, recommended when using hydroxychloroquine to start with a loading dose of 800 milligrams on the first day, then do 400 milligrams twice daily, or daily, sorry, for four to seven days. Um, when you look at the different protocols, you'll see that there are a variety of different dosing strategies. However, this was what was included in the um, uh, FDA recommendations. It is available, both are available in tablets. However, um, if a patient is unable to swallow or say is mechanically ventilated, this definitely creates an issue. Um, I found some conflicting information actually stating of whether or not it can be crushed. One source says that it must be compounded by pharmacy after the tablet film is removed. However, I was recently talking with our MICU pharmacist who educated me on a resource that they're currently using to support crushing at bedside and putting down an NG. Uh, as I mentioned, 
Uh, both drugs are metabolized to an active compound by several CYP enzymes. Most notably is that they are also moderate inhibitors of uh, CYP 2D6. So use caution when co-administrating the drug with concomitant medications uh, that are metabolized by 2D6. So this can be some of our antipsychotics, some beta blockers, or SSRI inhibitors in methadone. Um, you'll see increased uh, concentrations of that concomitant drug, so it's important to um, note. For centers that are using cyclosporin as their uh, GVHD prophylaxis, there have been two published reports that show significant alterations of cyclosporin concentrations when used particularly with uh, chloroquine. Next, I'm going to trans uh, switch gears and move to discuss uh, remdesivir on the next slide. So this is a medication that uh, is currently having a pretty good week with some positive preliminary data released by the manufacturer from the simple trial last Wednesday. Uh, it's an antiviral that exerts its effect by binding to the RNA-dependent RNA polymerase and acting as a delayed RNA chain terminator. Uh, the current NIH treatment guidelines, which I referenced with hydroxychloroquine, actually give a similar recommendation when using remdesivir and COVID-19 patients. As with the current data that is out there, they can't essentially recommend for or against. However, I will give a caveat that um, those recommendations did not include the preliminary data released last week by the manufacturer. Um, for use of remdesivir, patients will need to be enrolled in a clinical trial. Um, the manufacturer did have a compassionate use program that has now been converted into an expanded access program. Um, they are re retaining the compassionate use program for two spe special populations, so pregnant women as well as uh, young uh, patients with severe um, illness that can still potentially um, apply for compassionate use of remdesivir. And there's a lot of good information, um, and I'm going to give you some resources at the end uh, that have even more information on how to obtain the drug um, if possible. Um, on the next slide, um, we'll talk a little bit about uh, the dosing. So it's only available IV. Um, it has around a 20 to 24 hour half-life, which um, allows daily dosing. So 200 milligrams on day one, going down to 100 for the next 10 days. Again, there are several clinical trials ongoing with this drug that are looking at alternate, alternative dosing strategies uh, with different doses or durations of therapy. Uh, it is a prodrug, which is metabolized to its active nucleoside triphosphate form in the liver and a substrate to 2C8, C6, and 3A4. However, there's currently no identified drug interactions um, uh, to date. Previous trials, so this has been an agent that was utilized uh, in Ebola and SARS as well as MERS. Um, so looking at some of their clinical trials, we can get an idea of what the toxicity profile could be. And the main thing that jumps out is the um, liver toxicity seen as an increase of your ALT and AST. This is seen to occur around five to 25 days after initiation and resolve anywhere from three to 47 days. Um, this has resulted in specific liver um, exclusion criteria for any of these clinical trials. Um, so if you'll look in any of the protocols, typically um, AST or ALT greater than five times the upper limit uh, is an exclusion criteria. Uh, and this definitely could be an issue for th some of those seriously ill patients who need um, treatment options. There also um, are some considerations for renal dysfunction as well, with one of the trials needing creatinine clearances above 50 and others excluding when your creatinine was less than 30. Overall, though, it's a pretty well tolerated medication with lower incidences of the toxicities listed here on this screen. On the next slide, um, Another innovative therapy is the use of um, convalescent plasma. So essentially, trials are now seeking patients who tested positive for COVID-19 and have recovered and are able to donate plasma containing CD19 IgG antibodies. This approach has been used in other viral infections using cytomegalovirus or viricella in the past. Um, however, COVID-19 data is really limited to just some case reports and case series as there are multi-clinical multi, um, trials ongoing to see uh, what the effect is in the COVID-19 patients. Specifically, again, taking a peek at our um, special population of stem cell transplant patients, 
taking into um, thought the ABO mismatch patients um, and erroring on the safe side of using AD plasma might be our safest approach if they do um, become a candidate or this becomes a therapy that is uh, widely used. Um, on the next slide, we did include in our paper um, some other agents that now have kind of fallen out of favor as we've seen that their, their um, uses hasn't panned out. Um, several um, HIV proteasome inhibitors were looked at early on and investigated against CD19, um, including lopinavir, uh, ritonavir, which we mentioned in our paper. Um, however, as I mentioned, those investigations haven't really panned out, and the NIH panel recommends really against using any HIV proteasome inhibitors uh, for COVID-19 patients outside of the clinical trial due to unfavorable pharmacodynamics, as well as a lack of efficacy at this point. Um, Rivavirin, we talked about that a little bit, but really wasn't even mentioned in the NIH um, recommendations, so looks like it uh, did not show much promises and is not really relevant. Uh, further. On the next slide, I want to transition and talk about two agents um, that aren't really being used for the treatment of COVID-19, rather cytokine release sy syndrome associated with the virus. So tocilizumab is an IL-6 receptor antagonist that many of us are familiar with uh, in the setting of CRS associated with T-cell therapy or potentially blinitumumab therapy. Um, the NIH panel states that there is insufficient info to, again, recommend for or against using tocilizumab outside of a clinical trial. Uh, as for drug interactions, we typically don't think uh, monoclonal antibodies don't really make us think about drug interactions very often, but I did come up across some interesting uh, data that said in the setting of extreme inflammation and elevated IL-6 levels, this can uh, suppress hepatic SIP enzyme function. Therefore, a drastic alteration of IL-6 concentrations after giving tocilizumab or therapy, this could theoretically impact the liver metabolism. So something to keep in mind um, if things actually aren't adding up. Um, I know that often we see random things happen and always wanna know what the answer is, so this is something to keep in mind. Um, tocilizumab is a high cost drug that we keep a close watch on, uh, Maurice mentioned earlier. Um, so introducing a potentially new patient population led to some quick conversations um, at my institution to ensure that we had adequate stock at first for our CAR-T patients and then um, kind of the rest as it came for COVID-19. Ruxolitinib is also a medication most of us are probably familiar with as it is indicated. One of its three indications is for the treatment of steroid refractory acute GVHD. Investigators have proposed that uh, harnessing that immunomodulating property in the setting of CRS and COVID-19 uh, could potentially be beneficial and have um, started to investigate it within clinical trials. Uh, the NIH panel does mention this therapy and does state, however, due to its potent immunosuppressive risks in the setting of these severe infections, it would not recommend its use outside of a clinical trial. Ruxolitinib is metabolized by CYP3A4 and requires dosing adjustment when given with strong inhibitors or inducers, as well as any patients with renal dysfunction. Um, so, you know, infections, myelosuppression, these are some of the things we think about um, when we're using it in the setting of steroid refractory acute GVHD. However, it's unlikely to see um, these same toxicities if given in, as a short course uh, for CRS treatment. On the next slide, I included a chart that we included in the paper, which was really just teasing out some of the most common immunosuppressive medications that we're using as our GVHD prophylaxis, um, and then comparing the current uh, agents and seeing the potential for drug interaction in the patient or the different uh, therapies. So um, the main area that we saw potential was going to be when using uh, lopinavir, ritonavir. This is our HIV PI, which as we know, a lot of them has, have issues with uh, drug interactions, so not uh, largely concerning or surprising, sorry. Um, and then also you'll notice the potential increase with the hydroxychloroquine chloroquine arm with our cyclosporin. Um, tacrolimus and cerulimus, and really this is going to stem from those case reports with uh, hydroxychloroquine and cyclosporin, um, keeping you in mind that that could be potentially extrapolated out to those other agents. 
And then lastly, on the next slide, um, you know, we've all seen so much uh, information put out so quickly, some of it very high quality, some not so much. Um, so it's really hard to keep um, straight on what is the latest and the greatest. Um, and so I listed on this slide just a few key resources that I recommend and have relied on to get some um, up-to-date quality data. Um, I've listed for you the NIH uh, treatment guidelines. So this is that expert panel. Uh, these will likely be constantly updated as more um, uh, data is published. Um, the Society of Infectious Disease Pharmacists, which are included in the NIH panel, they have a great website um, that currently has a bunch of very detailed um, presentations on kind of teasing out each agent that's um, being looked at for the treatment of COVID right now, and those are also updated as more information comes out. Um, another great pharmacy resource is idstewardship.com. Um, plethora of information on this site, updated uh, pretty frequently, um, is kind of a good kind of catch-all for a lot of different detailed information. And then lastly, um, the University of Liverpool has a great website for drug-drug interactions. That's where I got a lot of the information for the previous table, um, as well as they have resources on how to handle patients who are having issues um, with taking oral meds. Um, so these are just a few of the great resources that I recommend checking out if you're looking um, to get up-to-date information um, as it's an ever-changing um, kind of treatment uh, situation for COVID-19. So with that, I think I will hand it back to Zara um, and open, I think, summary. Yeah. So thank you, Maurice. Thank you, Katie. So in summary, our practice models and our workflows should be designed to minimize exposure to both patients and our healthcare workers. Telehealth has certainly expanded um, our ability to support social distancing and should be embraced as a strategy for delivering care moving forward. Um, it should be leveraged to support remote practice models and virtual care. And the recommendations and the guidelines continue to evolve, um, so there are insufficient data to support a recommendation for any particular agent, um, and treatment on a clinical trial is encouraged. And with that, I'd like to thank all of our members of not just this panel today, but all of the members of our ASTCT Pharmacy SIG Steering Committee um, who contributed to the manuscript, and we will now open for questions. So feel free to use the question and answer box um, there on the bottom of your screen. The very first question I have is, um, are you utilizing any wearable technologies or apps to help you monitor and engage with patients when working remotely? Um, so uh, Maurice, do you want to take a stab at answering this one first? Oh, uh, yeah. Can you, you repeat my question just so I can make sure I heard it correctly? Yes. Um, are you utilizing any wearable technologies or apps to help you monitor and engage with patients when working remotely? Yeah, we, we, we use um, cellular devices, but nothing that we're monitoring, nothing that we're wearing to um, engage or um, follow patients. Katie, how about you? Yeah, no, we don't. That's a really good idea. And as someone who was just at home for five weeks and is back in the office today, um, that would be very interesting to have kind of that look of kind of where people are and to be able to tap in with the engagement component, I think is really good. Um, I can just, you know, say from our experience as this was kind of the first time ever having an alternative working, um, you know, situation, um, a lot of it was left up to the practitioner on their own, you know, to kind of reach out, even though, you know, managers are definitely trying to engage, but it was definitely a new scenario to kind of be on my own in a different area. So I could see if this continues to be um, something that happens time after time that something more formal uh, could come around to kind of track timing and engagement. Yeah, um, I certainly also have not um, been using, um, or, or here at KU, we have not been using um, those sorts of technologies, although the patients can communicate with us pretty easily via my chart within our EPIC EMR, um, but nothing wearable, so good question. Um, our next question is, given your use of digital technology, do you think you'll continue to use some of this post-pandemic, and do you see opportunities to change practice? Um, 
being a stab at this first, I think, yes, certainly. I, I think really widened our ability to think outside the box. Um, you know, I think we're thinking of work responsibilities that can be done from home more long term, um, as well as the Zoom capability of being able to talk to patients and caregivers prior to the patient being discharged from the hospital. Usually on discharge day, there's a lot happening and there's, um, it's really difficult to make sure you have the full attention of the family um, in terms of patient. It's important that they pay attention when you discharge them. So um, certainly having the capability of, of scheduling that appointment at their convenience and doing this visit virtually is something that we're certainly exploring. Maurice, have you guys um, thought about this? Yeah, in fact, there's been a bit of expansion of telehealth services at UNC. Um, prior to COVID, we actually had a virtual care center um, that was uh, kind of the central resource for building and rolling out virtual services across the medical center. Uh, but there, there didn't seem to be a, a huge demand for those services at the time. And so when COVID-19 hit, we were really um, forced to scale up telehealth services in a very, at a very rapid pace. And so because there wasn't a lot of demand from it uh, when a virtual care center was leading that effort, there, wasn't also, there also wasn't a lot of demand to expand that team. Um, and so we found that they needed support in order to scale things up um, in the way that we needed to. And so our electronic is embedded epic professionals that were tasked with helping to build out and grow um, telehealth um, for COVID. Um, and I've spoken with, with a couple of them and the goal and plan is to continue that build out and, and, and to continue to kind of shape some of those services even beyond COVID-19. And so there's been quite a bit of growth in talking to them. We, we had about, um, a hundred providers that were provisioned to, to deliver telehealth services at our medical center. Um, and prior to COVID-19, we were doing about 25 um, telehealth visits a month. And that's data from about January, from January and February. Um, now, fast forward to, I think data as of early April, uh, we have um, over 2000 providers provisioned to give telehealth services and we're doing over a thousand virtual care visits a day. And so I do think that that is probably something that will continue to expand and grow even beyond COVID-19. Great, thank you. Katie, do you wanna take a stab at this question as well? Yeah, I kind of just agree with what Maurice said and um, at our program, we were kind of already moving towards telehealth. It was a big push and component of our cellular therapy program to be able to do um, visits through our telehealth. So we had spent a lot of time in the last year amping up that program. And then when COVID came, um, we were actually able to just kind of move that uh, into our transplant patients. And, you know, any patients who didn't need to be coming in daily or needing to get checks, we could quickly move them into our telehealth visit um, template, as well as with our survivorship program, we're doing a ton with telehealth. So we're able to loop, move a lot of those visits that, as kind of Maurice said, people were definitely more comfortable with the inpatient or the in-person visits. So they weren't always going to these telehealth, even though we had the structure there to use it. Now it forced a lot of people to go ahead and do it. And I think it moving forward, we're going to be usually utilizing it so much more since this forced us to be comfortable with it. Awesome. Thank you. Um, our next question is, have you had any success with billing for these telehealth services? Um, I will tell you that certainly Kansas is not billing currently for um, pharmacists. So I, either Katie or Maurice, if one of you guys are successfully able to do this, I'll let you start with that. No, same here. No billing, yeah. unfortunately, for us. Yeah, I think um, for, 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 for North Carolina, I think the one, the one big win that I can speak of is that North Carolina Medicaid, um, they grew their list of providers that could be um, that deliver reimbursable telehealth services in, in, in clinical funds and outpatient settings made it onto that list. Uh, I still think that there is there remains kind of a big question about 
the the billing codes um, and the and the specific types of services that we're delivering via telehealth that we could bill for. But uh, it was basically a to see them a little bit of aspect to deliver. Great. Um, the next question is, how do you assess or evaluate productivity for staff that are working remotely? Maurice, you are kind of going in and out. Um, so if you want to get a little bit closer to your speaker, um, do you want to tackle this question? Hey, can you hear me okay? Yes, much better. Okay, sorry about that. Um, and so that was, the question was about productivity, is that right? Yep. Okay. I think um, we we have typically monitored our um, uh, the productivity of our pharmacists, particularly those in the outpatient setting, and so we kind of have um, dashboards that track their encounter volume and things like that. And so um, we have we we actually took an approach of kind of modifying some of those dashboards and reports to be able to be better reflective of the services that they were providing in the context of COVID. So we were able to capture some of that virtual activity. So whether they're doing phone visits or whether they're doing um, virtual visits via video, um, we're able to capture that in the report. We are getting some of that daily on a week, uh, you know, on a week. Reese, I think we lost you. I think what you said was you're doing that on a weekly basis. Is that correct? Yeah, sorry if you guys if you guys couldn't hear me. Yeah, so we were we've been able to capture some of the virtual activity that our pharmacists have been doing, and even some of the activity before, including the in-person visits. We've been able to kind of track that data on a weekly basis. Thank you, Katie. How about you guys? Um, no, I'm not aware of anything. Like I said, this has been a very new transition that we've really just kind of came up with our plan um, over the last five weeks. So, um, and also in my role, I'm not in a managerial role, so I'm not totally aware if any of those have been um, constructed. Yeah. I think for us, the challenge is certainly creating and defining what a dashboard could look like and what does productivity mean because it can vary from patient to patient. So for example, an education versus an end of treatment visit are two completely different um, time, uh, time points and, and can take more time than others. And so productivity is kind of difficult for us to track, but it has been helpful to have our remote huddles or our virtual huddles, I should say, to kind of assess on a day-to-day -day basis how the work is being handled. And if someone, you know, has, has too much on their plate, then we can try to divvy up the work amongst the others that are working um, virtually as well. So we don't have anything really set in place per se, um, though we're working toward that as well. Um, Okay, um, the next question is, what steps has your institution taken to sequester tocilizumab for, uh, to ensure stock for CAR-T patients? Katie, do you wanna take this one? Sure, yeah, so um, as soon as we heard, you know, reports of utilizing tocilizumab for CRS associated with COVID-19, um, I think it caught all of our attentions as um, something that could potentially be a big problem since knowing we already had it in stock for our CAR-T patients. Um, the, you know, we kind of got a bunch of emails together with our PMT committee, with pharmacy, um, our IEC committee um, heads and kind of talked about what we wanted to do. And really what we did is we kind of looked at our volume over the past few months and then were able to sequester a amount to keep for the next two or three months to cover um, CAR-T patients. I will say that, you know, the other thing that's happening is that then, you know, kind of transplant programs are slowing down or being more selective with their picks. So we have not been as active. Um, so we do have ample stock, um, but we are able to kind of pull that aside and then have pharmacy purchasing say, okay, so anything that we purchase moving forward, we'll be able to use for COVID-19 and then we'll keep the stock separate um, for what you expect for your CAR-T patients. Great. Maurice, have you guys done anything different? <laughs> We, something very similar. And so uh, we actually, we, our institution actually developed a, um, a medication tracking report. Um, and so it, there was a list of medications that became um, 
high volume use med, used med, medications um, in the context of COVID. And so tocilizumab is one of the medications on that list. And so we were able to monitor usage, whether it was for COVID uh, indications or for CRS from CAR-T therapy. Um, and so one of the things that we did to preserve or conserve supply for our CAR-T patients, given the REMS requirement to have enough stock on hand, um, we also sequestered um, drugs. And so we separated out our CAR T supply and made sure that the minimum amount of stock that we kept on hand at any given time was enough for our CAR T volumes. And then we also kept a separate supply for COVID-19. Um, and those, those were physically in different locations. And so that has really helped us kind of navigate um, um, our recent circumstances. Awesome. Yeah, I would say the same thing for um, KU. We definitely also created a medication tracking report, not just for TOSI, but for all of the agents used for treatment of COVID. Um, and same thing where we separated the supply. We also indicated on the label or within EPIC um, when it is to be administered, it differentiating that it's being given for a COVID patient as opposed to a CAR-T patient, just because you know, our REMS requirements are pretty strict in terms of how quickly the TOSI needs to be administered for CAR-T. Um, our volumes for CAR-T ne didn't necessarily go down per se, um, but certainly we've been able to, with our sequestered stocks, able to um, keep that all together. Um, okay, so then our next question is, have you, have any of you had experience implementing use of low-dose vasopressors or other medical management on your HS, uh, HS, HCT unit, normally necessitating transfer to the intensive care unit in order to minimize exposure of our vulnerable patient populations to other healthcare providers, patients, areas of the hospital where COVID-19 is managed? Katie, do you want to answer this question first? Yeah, sure. Um, I will say that we've been pretty lucky here in Nashville and that our numbers have stayed pretty um, low within the hospital for us to be able to um, keep patients somewhat sequestered, which is nice. How, and I don't have any experience at this current time. However, we have done this numerous times with CAR T cell uh, patients in the past. We, the only vasopressor that we can use is phenylephrine on our floor without them going into an ICU unit. So. Um, very often we've had patients where we can um, optimize their blood pressure just using phenylephrine. Um, and then, you know, when we're also then giving tocilizumab or other supportive care, uh, keep things under control and keep them out of an ICU. Great. Maurice, what about your experience in North Carolina? Yeah, unfortunately that has not been a, a practice that we have adopted. Um, I, I agree with the idea and that it, it seems like a great strategy to minimize exposure to the patients that might be in um, critical care units. But um, uh, if if a patient does need pressor support, then um, at UNC in our unit, it still does require a transfer for that escalation of care. And so they do go to the ICU. Yeah, it's the same here in one, Kansas. One thing that I can say, Go ahead, Mark. Sorry. Sorry. One thing that I can add is we, we had conversation about um, really delivering like cytokine therapy and things like that to reverse some of these syndromes much earlier in the process. I think we were already giving them early, but we have had conversations about making sure we give it at the first signs of these syndromes to make sure we can prevent transfer to the ICU uh, when we can. Oh. Well, that's very interesting. Um, I I'd certainly um, appreciate the question. I think it's a really great thought. Um, you know, some of our beds in our transplant unit are tele tele capable, um, and and so um, we would have the capability of doing that. But we haven't gone down or had that conversation about um, allowing for our um, the administration of low dose phase oppressors. I, I think our nursing colleagues would be a little uncomfortable with doing that on the unit, but certainly something to consider should things get kind of um, should, should things get, should things change um, rapidly? Good question. And I think with that, we're at the top of the hour. So I appreciate, and I think we all appreciate that um, your guys' attention, your questions, and certainly um, I'm willing to continue the conversation elsewhere if you have additional questions that come up. 
Yes, and thank you all and thank you to our, our wonderful speakers for generously donating their time and expertise to this webinar today. Um, just as a reminder, the slides and recording of this webinar will be posted to the ASTCT COVID-19 community page. Um, and if you have any additional questions, you can either make a post directly on that community page or email us at info at ASTCT.org. Thank you so much for your attention this afternoon and we hope that you have a wonderful rest of the day.